Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tom Stites, and it is my honor to introduce today's Ber Berkman lunch speaker. I was a 2010-11 Berkman fellow, and I lead a journalism startup called The Banyan Project. And some decades ago, I was a police reporter, and you'll shortly see why that's pertinent. A uh, little housekeeping. Uh, please know that today's presentation and the questions and answers are being webcast, and the video will be archived and open for all to see forevermore. So please remember that if you join the conversation, uh, be careful what you say because it is being recorded. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, the, <laughs> it's, the, it's the Berkman custom to go around the room and introduce ourselves, but Laura and her topic have attracted so many people that that would take half the uh, time we have, so we're going to skip it. But please, if you do uh, join the conversation with a question or something, Identify yourself before you speak. Say who, uh, who you are and what your affiliation is. Laura Amico is a Neiman Berkman Fellow and recipient of an impressive list of other fellowships and honors that matter in the world of journalism. To describe Laura as a journalist is accurate but deeply inadequate. She is also a visionary and a person of soul who cares deeply about people and about their lives, and about journalism and the civic world that it nourishes. This will become obvious when I get out of the way so that Laura can begin her presentation. Laura is CEO of Homicide Watch, which established itself by covering every murder in the District of Columbia. Its crisp motto is, mark every death, remember every victim, follow every case. In doing this, Homicide Watch exposes all homicides to the air and light and to caring, no matter who the victim is. Homicide Watch has proven so powerful that Laura and her husband and tech partner, Chris, uh, have found news organizations to partner with in four more cities and more possibilities are in the works. So are efforts to apply Homicide Watch's model to other topics. This success has come from just the right balance of professional reporting, data such as the phone number of the detective assigned to the case, presentation of public records, aggregation of links and information from other sources, and community contributions, often from friends and family of victims and friends and family of suspects. What this boils down to is that Homicide Watch exemplifies what journalism is about in the digital age. It allows newsrooms to work smarter, to amplify what one reporter can accomplish by a lot. It presents quality information, brings communities together, gives people a voice, and illuminates their dignity in the worst of times. Take it away. Thank you. Jazz. It's funny because for me it's a harder topic than homicides. <laughs> there was a night this spring that Wynton Marsalis played at Sanders Theater. I don't know if many of you were there, and I was thrilled to be. It was a difficult one, because our community had just experienced the horror of the marathon bombing. It was an appropriate night for music because of this. Introducing Marsalis, Harvard President Drew Faust said, no one knows better than Winton that art and music are for times of sorrow as well as celebration. He shows us that music is a means of capturing human experience that connects us to something larger than ourselves. This is precisely what so many of my journalist colleagues 
were doing at that same moment, too. Responding to crisis with storytelling. Building for us a context to understand our grief, sadness, and fear. Marcellus said that evening, sometimes the expression of grief is such a heavy feeling that only playing will suffice. I think every journalist who has responded to tragedy, either as large as the marathon bombings or the smaller but just as significant tragedies of single lives lost to violence or accident, understands this. That sometimes only writing or photography or videography or programming will suffice. Journalism and jazz both call to our inner selves. Marsalis taught me this that night in Sanders Theater. They're where we turn for comfort, for sense making, for explaining and experiencing our world as we see it. And more than that, our world as we would like it to become. That night was part jazz theory lesson, part concert, and overall a magical reflection on what it means to play jazz as a trumpeter or a drummer or even as an audience member. It was also for me a reflection on what it means to be a journalist. When Marsalis said jazz, I kept hearing journalism. When he said improvisation, I heard innovation. And I began to see my work and my journalism startup in new ways through Marsalis's lens of jazz. I've since learned that I wasn't the first. Many of my Neiman friends sitting that, in that audience along with me heard the same change in wording. And I've learned since then also that jazz itself has been applied as a metaphor to many industries, many artistic pursuits, and even by Marsalis to life itself. Clearly there is some grand thinking here. But I think there's a power to this metaphor too. And this is what has really captured me in the ensuing weeks. Tom Stites sent me a jazz sermon, which quoted Suzanne P. Meyer, who spoke about the application of jazz as a lens to religion. And she asked, what if we were to search and discover these same values in a completely different cultural context? Is it possible to gain a deeper appreciation for the universality of our faith by attempting to describe it through an entirely different set? of metaphors. Jazz, for journalism, would be an entirely different set of metaphor. And I think there's a lot to be gained by this, by taking journalism out of the journalism context and discussing it maybe in different terms, by speaking even just briefly in metaphor. Because it opens us up to new pathways, new ways of being, of expressing ourselves, and of wanting different things, which is so important for us. But I do believe, too, that there's more here than metaphor. In the research that I've done since Marsalis sparked this interest in me, I've learned that jazz and improvisation theories have, in fact, informed management theories in many fields, particularly within turbulent markets, ranging from the arts to healthcare systems management offering a framing for new understandings of teamwork, leadership, and innovation. By some estimates, newsrooms have, newsrooms have fired as many as a third of their newsroom staffs in recent years. New publishing structures are reforming how audiences interact with their news sources and also what they expect of their news sources. And new distribution networks are changing what even a news report can be. Scholars of complex adaptive systems theories, a branch of innovation and management theories that sounds very far away from jazz, but is in fact rooted in those same principles Marcellus spoke about. Those theories tell us that innovation processes often successfully unfold through improvisation, through serendipitous but intentional action in changing environments. 
the sort that happens on stage at a jazz concert when musicians improvise, each responding to one another, to the audience, and to the process of playing music. We need innovation, improvisation, jazz in journalism. And so Marsalis, I think, offers us a way forward to build the journalism industry, not just that journalists need, but that our public needs too. I feel like an unlikely person to be thinking about this. As Tom mentioned, I am primarily a journalist. Um, and it's taken me a long time to even think of myself as an entrepreneur, though I do have this company. Primarily, I'm awkward thinking about this topic because I'm not an academic. And turning to theory, complex adaptive systems in particular, to explain what I know as hard work, daily deadlines, and a way of life feels very unusual. I come to this subject through the Tau Center's study this year on post-industrial journalism. And that study describes what so many of us in the industry know and are very familiar with, and that is the cataclysmic change that we've experienced. Not only are our business structures failing in journalism, but as that study pointed out, our processes for how we do journalism, too, are failing. It's clear at this point that we will not get to the future of journalism by doing what we are doing today, or even what we might be doing tomorrow, but that it will be something entirely new. I've spent the past nine months here at Harvard in a blissful state of fellowship thinking about journalism innovation. Much of that time I've spent thinking about the work that I've done with Homicide Watch, the work that I'd like to do in the future, and the work that news organizations are in fact doing today. In 2010, I started this website called Homicide Watch DC on a little WordPress site that I set up myself without having any knowledge of how WordPress worked or any programming skills. It was pretty ugly but it worked, and it was my first experience with improvisation. And though the road has been long and rocky, I stand before you here today exceedingly proud of the company that has built from that one little website, a company that my husband Chris and I have built together, and a company that we hope and think, and some others tell us, offers a way forward for journalism. <coughs> Here in Cambridge, the Berkman Center and Neiman Foundation have given me room to think about what makes Homicide Watch work, what makes it unique. And for much of the year, I've struggled with this question because I had this sense that really we had just gotten pretty darn lucky. That things clicked into place at the right moments and that we had captured some sort of magic that made this site work in the way that it did. And I worried all year that you all would catch on and realize that because Homicide Watch was this magical creation, that there wasn't anything significant that I could offer you, no pathway forward to replicate what I'd done. I was wrong, and Jazz has taught me that. Mine is a post-Watergate generation of journalists. We were inspired to newsrooms, not by Woodward and Bernstein, but others. We're a digital natives generation. We used word processors in elementary school, AOL in high school, Napster in college, and Twitter in the early years of our careers. We publish on WordPress, Tumblr, and Instagram, and check in on Foursquare. At least, at least those of us who aren't homicide reporters check in on Foursquare. <laughs> Our professional years have been marked by the gathering of reporters and editors at the publisher's office door for announcements of layoffs, of scouring job boards, going to networking mixers, and chatting always about who was hiring and how many dozens or hundreds of applications were received for that singular job. We've been backpack journalists and bloggers 
entrepreneurs and disruptors. To put this into context, Chris built a timeline to explain the disruption that has marked our careers. And uh, we can start here with Blogger in 1999. Uh, I was a junior in high school this year. When, shortly when I was into college, Craigslist expanded. And then we had Doc Searles writing about post-industrial journalism. I still wasn't in the journalism industry. WordPress was released in 2003. Facebook was founded in 2004. And Chris and I graduated from UC Santa Cruz. <laughs> we took jobs at small papers, the Register Pajaronian for me and the Antelope Valley Press for Chris. Django Framework was released. And this is the framework Homicide Watch was years later built on. Ruby on Rails, and a series of other disruptions within our industry. In 2007, I started at the Press Democrat, a regional paper in Santa Rosa, California, where I covered the crime beat. Talking Points Memo won the Polk Award, and Chris started at PBS NewsHour. In September 2010, I was unemployed. Chris had moved us across the country, and I assumed that I could find a job as a crime reporter in Washington, DC. And that was easier said than done. Because I was looking for homicide coverage in my neighborhood to understand what was happening to the people I was living with, I started looking at the press for stories about homicides and didn't find any. In that situation, I started my own site. Then we relaunched in August 2011, and then came here. It's a short history, but a full one, and one that has been marked by more change than many journalists experience in their entire careers. This is my generation of journalists' news industry. Within it, I believe we do have the chance for greatness. But as David Scott and Clay Christensen said in their recent feature on disruption for Neiman Reports, getting there is going to take an incredible mix of awareness, confidence, imagination, and ability. I think it will also take jazz. Here's why. Marsalis describes jazz as the art of managing change without losing the focus on substance. The art of managing change without losing the focus on substance. <coughs> Journalism is change too, as we saw, but also within the work that reporters do every day, chasing out to the scene of a fire at one moment and then off to the school board meeting the next. In our everyday lives, we blend in instinct and expertise, performance and conversation, improvisation and swing time in a continuously changing environment. And in this post-industrial world, this is increasingly true. The super, disruption, the super disruption of journalism has shortened that loop between audience and journalists, at times making it near instantaneous. And so I picture journalists now standing on stage, responding to audiences in real time or close to real time. If you consider, for example, a practice I call reporting from analytics and first wrote about in October 2011, very briefly, I began using Google and WordPress to monitor the search terms people were using to come into Homicide Watch DC. When I looked at those search terms, I learned the words that people were using to, dis to discuss homicides. I learned what information they had and what information they were looking for. And I began to picture what gaps existed among what I knew, what the police knew, and what my audience knew, which was more than anyone else combined. When a search term would appear that didn't match the coverage that I had on the site, I assumed that it was someone searching for coverage that didn't yet exist. So I take those search terms and I flip them back on the web. This means searching Twitter and Facebook for the same or similar words to the ones that grabbed my initial attention, 
For example, if I saw a search that said, Joe killed, I'd search RIP Joe, RIP Joseph, or Joe died. This could lead me to posts about Joe's death, and it works. Those tips would also lead me to sources who would talk to me about what they were experiencing and what they were feeling. Not just my audience, but my collaborators. And those would become conversations. A decade ago, this interaction would have taken an entire news cycle. Joe's family and friends would have picked up the paper the day after he was killed and scoured it for a report of what happened. Not finding one, they might call the newsroom and through a series of call transfers, make their way to a reporter who could write the story. A more familiar scenario to many of you might be the reporter's use of Twitter to report, connect with sources, and publish in what can be a multi-party conversation. The fire department says Fifth Street is closed, a reporter might tweet. Seconds later, there are three responses. That explains why I'm stuck in traffic. I'm here, and I see a lot of fire trucks. It looks like they're trying to get a kitten out of a tree. Live performances of jazz, and jazz improvisation in particular, create a moment-by-moment -moment feedback loop, just like this. The intention of the musician becomes auditory and transmitted to the audience. The audience absorbs that information and responds by listening quietly, by laughing, crying, clapping, booing, getting up to leave, or rushing the stage. Those actions echo back to the stage where the musician can gauge whether he's being heard or not, is appreciated or not, and can modify, if necessary, what he is playing and how. For journalists, this is an incredible opportunity. This wasn't possible with print newspapers in the same sense. And I think we're only beginning to grasp now what this shortened loop between performer and audience, journalist and, re and audience means. Spend some time with Chartbeat or Google Analytics in a newsroom today, or even your own blog or website and the audience becomes live in a way that we haven't experienced before in journalism, even though the face-to-face -face is mediated by the web. This shortened publication audience response cycle has been a disruptive one for the journalism industry. And though much of the work of disruption in our industry has focused on revenue, I think that the post-industrial lens shows us that our challenges are not only revenue-based, or rather, that the revenue problem is a symptom of a deeper illness, that the way we work itself is ill. Many newspaper websites today look a lot like the newspapers that are still rolling off the printing presses. The stories have a headline, a byline, a lead. Maybe they're written in, in an inver inverted paragraph structure. Our beats are organized in the same way, the crime beat, the education beat, City Hall. And what we ask of our readers has remained the same, too. That they pay for a subscription and that they read our stories. <clears throat> there are some larger, more complex projects and experiments that have been done. Snowfall was a beautiful one this year. WBUR's Bad Chemistry, which recently just launched. Schoolbook from WNYC and Homicide Watch. But these typically remain as projects and don't exist within the newsroom framework of what journalists do every day. And so maintaining these projects becomes the biggest battle for maintaining innovation within newsrooms. It's a sign that we still haven't grasped how much has changed or that we have the opportunity and responsibility to imagine something different. It's not just about the look of the product but the role and the new stage this is happening on. One where we can and should ask, is this the best way to tell this story? What does the audience need to understand about the city council? 
How do we need our readers to respond? What are we asking of them? What are they telling us? What is the conversation that is happening here? When we ask these questions, the very dynamic of our work changes in a way that can best be described through improvisation theory. Improvisation and closely related comp complex adaptive systems theories have been applied to many fields undergoing continuous change. And what I like about these theories are that they address the processes of how we work. Improvisation is routine breaking. And if what is broken in journalism is our process, our routine, then improvisation can help us move beyond what is broken. In fact, this is exactly what Scott and Christensen argue is so important to the industries dealing with disruption. Industries dealing with disruption must, they write, form new processes and priorities that closely match the requirements of the new jobs to be done. This is what Homicide Watch did. The idea for Homicide Watch was built on an approach that has a foundation in journalism. But it's structured by facts and tools that the community can use to discuss and to understand the cases that we cover. We built the site, writing it in AP style, in part to brand the site as a news organization, but also because I thought it was important that my voice not be the strongest on the site. I wanted to create space, as Marsalis would say, for other voices. For those closest to the stage, for those closest to the cases to take the stage, to solo, to tell their own stories in ways that I didn't have the instrument to tell them. And that's exactly what happened. As soon as we started, people in the community realized that this was a space where they could tell their stories. And they started coming forward. We have a comments of the day thread on the site that highlights the most significant comments that have been left. They come from victims' families, friends, and colleagues and the suspects, friends, families, and colleagues, too. When you read these comments all together, you get a real sense of how violent crime is experienced in the community. It was because we focused on the substance of what we did, of the reporting, of the data collection, and of our commitment, every death, crime to conviction, that we were able to improvise and build this community. Because our component parts were so strong, we were able to move forward and push the boundaries of what journalism could accomplish. And I think that we created something pretty special. Clay Shirky wrote about Homicide Watch in a recent Columbia Journalism Review story and said very graciously that what Homicide Watch has shown us is how to do better reporting for civically vital issues at lower cost and greater benefit. But what I really love is this. For all the neutral style and straight ahead presentation, the greatest gift as people inventing a new model of journalism, turns out to be their sense of humanity. And this is something that I think now, without knowing it, we drew from jazz. The humanity of what we are doing is so important. So often in journalism, we see formulas of story plus photo plus video plus interactive data equals award-winning package. This works sometimes and often. And these stories and videos and photos and complex packages are beautiful and awe-inspiring. But sometimes they don't have that humanity. They don't have that spark. Because they're built to check things off a formula and not to ask the question, of what the audience needs. And they're not built to be in conversation with the audience either. And guess what? 
the audience knows this. But show them something different that says, I invite you in. I was thinking of you. Share this with me. And that's a whole different ballgame. That's improvisation. <coughs> Mostly, I think we must remember this. You get there by process, but you get there with your heart. And this is where jazz takes us. This year has been an incredible one for me, being able to be here and learn all the incredible things that Harvard has to offer. And it's a year that, that has brought me here to standing at the Berkman Center and talking about jazz, which is something that I certainly could never have imagined back in September, but has opened up my work and my thinking about journalism in new and incredible ways. It felt like for so much of the year, I was looking for answers, because that's what we do in journalism. We want to solve the business model, the editorial structure. We want to know how to engage new audiences. But this is not an answers talk. Because what I've learned this year is that there isn't a singular answer. I think there is, however, a way forward. And that begins with adding improvisation to the journalism process. Because what we can do as we explore, develop, and implement new models of journalism is to manage change without losing the focus on substance. What we can do is to report with improvisation. Thank you. Providing a forum for the discussion of uh, homicide or reaching the truth on an issue of the taking of a life of a human being is it's pretty much non-controversial. It's fairly, it's on the side of the angels. Everybody agrees that it's a tremendous violation, not only of the individual's rights, but also of the social compact. Now, uh, supposing you had uh, launched an enterprise which described itself as analogously um, police and FBI malfeasance dot watch or however watch dot com, mm -hmm. whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, what do you think the response would have been and how do you think your experience would have been different? Oh boy, good question. Um, I, I think that I would have applied the same process to you know, a, a category like that, as, as we did to this. Um, the structure of Homicide Watch and the purpose of it is so very clear and evident now. And the need for the site is so very clear and evident now. It was not three years ago. Um, I, I pitched the project to newsrooms um, around DC, and I was told that um, the, uh, the community wasn't interested in homicides, that um, it was too hard to cover every homicide, that they were all just drug deals gone bad. Um, and so part of what we did was to start with those mo innermost seeds, the individual crime, the individual victim, the individual suspect and case, and build out from there, looking at the structure of how those pieces interacted and, and came together <laughs> with one another um, and built community around that. And I think that that's the key, really, when we look at, at covering any beat um, in a new and modern way, whether it is something that seems um, the work of angels today or, or something other than that. Um, and that's how we move forward. In your experience so far, has your site uh, facilitated either the solving of any of these crimes or the exoneration of people who shouldn't have been accused of them in the first place? Yeah, the site has been up um, for just almost three years now. We're coming up on that three-year anniversary. And just a year ago, we started seeing cases that we were covering go to trial. A case enters our system. Uh, when the crime occurs, so we didn't go back and cover old cases. 
A homicide case in Washington, D.C. takes, on average, we think about two years um, from the time of arrest to trial. So we certainly haven't gotten to any exonerations. Um, I, I do know uh, the Washingtonian did a story about Homicide Watch DC, and the very first case we covered back when we were a baby site and didn't know what we were doing, um, somebody you know put this young woman who had been killed, put her name into Google, came onto this you know WordPress site, and realized that they had some information to share with the police, and did so. That case was closed. Um, it was our very first case. It, it's hard to get any information about anymore. Um, when I said exoneration, I didn't mean formally like somebody being tried and found innocent. I meant that because of your site, other pe mm. cases where somebody was quickly or not so quickly removed from consideration as a suspect because of information that you gathered. Yeah, not that I know of. Um, I'm Priya Kumar. I'm an inter a summer intern at the Berkman Center. Welcome. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. <laughs> um, my question focuses on the, the point that you ended with, this idea that improvisation needs to be part of um, our thought process as everyone goes forth, whether they're in a newsroom or not in a newsroom. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering, what do you think is the biggest... Um, obstacle that we have to overcome in getting that? Is it really a mindset thing in that people, you know, people are used to that, that process, that beat mm -hmm. process that, that people were doing for a long time. And now, of course, everyone's <clears throat> trying to figure out what is my thought process or how am I doing it? Or is it, I know the Tau Center report talked a lot about, you know, content management systems mm -hmm. suck a lot of times mm -hmm. in newsrooms and they don't allow for that kind of innovation. So what are you seeing as the biggest challenges to moving towards this embrace of improvisation? Yeah, good question. I, I think that the Tau Center report really, um, really got that right. That is so hard to do anything outside of the systems that we use within our newsrooms. Doing anything outside of the system often requires a separate budget. It requires a special team of people. Um, and sometimes it involves bringing other people like me and Chris into the newsroom to help that process. Um, I would love to see more of this work happening inside of the structures that newsrooms are using for their everyday work. So that when they think about their crime beat, for example, or their education beat, or their city hall beat, um, they're asking these questions not just in a way of asking, how can we present this information differently, which is really that, the big question that is asked, um, but instead asking, what does our audience need from this? What is the conversation that they are already having with us about this beat? And how can we be a bigger part of that conversation? Um, I think that's key. Uh, George Mokre, independent scholar from Central Square. It took you about a half an hour to get to the, what I think is the key word, community. Mm. And I've been waiting for somebody in journalism to talk about community in relationship to uh, the way that journalism must go on for about 20 years. Mm -hmm. And let me illustrate this by a story, a famous jazz story. Duke Ellington and the orchestra in 1956, Newport. He was supporting the orchestra through his publishing royalties. It was not making any money. People were saying he was old hat, it's gone, forget about it. He comes on to the stage, plays a smoking set, and then Paul Gonzalez gets up to do a solo on diminuendo and crescendo in blue. It goes on for what, about 16 minutes? A long time. And what's important about this is not necessarily what was happening on the stage. What happened in the stands was mm -hmm. that a beautiful blonde woman in a tight dress <laughs> got up to dance. And they started playing off of that. If you know anything about jazz history, there's a really sharp dem demarcation line between swing and bebop when people stopped dancing. What I've seen going to Berkman Center and, and to uh, the Shorenstein Center over many years is a journalistic 
community, which is antagonistic mm -hmm. to what they call their audience or their readership. They don't want to let the people in. And I think what you're talking about is letting the people in mm -hmm. and playing with the dancers. Exactly. Playing with the community. And I wish you would talk a little bit more about that. Uh, I'm happy you've, you found that in my talk because, as I mentioned at the beginning, I've just come to this very, very recently. Um, it is, however, something that I think deeply informs how I think about journalism, and that is that journalism is a resource not for the community but of the community. Um, what I believe most deeply about journalism is that at its heart, it's just storytelling. And it's telling the stories of our communities. When we think about why we tell our stories, it's so that we can share them with one another, so that we can acknowledge one another's experiences, and so that together we can form some identity of who we are, and I think ultimately an identity of who we would hope to be. That doesn't happen in newsrooms that are big, tall, brick buildings without windows where journalists just sit at desks. Um, I have been lucky to work with editors who say, I don't want to see you at your desk. Go out, talk to people, do reporting. Um, there are editors that believe that, and there are reporters who do that. I think that increasingly that's going to be the way forward. Thank you. Um, I'm a journalist, but my beat is jazz, so I oh, came to this terrific. talk with a slightly different perspective and also having thought about what I could learn from jazz as a writer. Mm -hmm. um, and there are many things I could say, but I just wanted to confine it to an early point you made about how other analogies have been drawn with jazz. And just to call your and the audience's attention to a gentleman named John Edward Hasse. I believe the name is spelled H-A-S-S-E. He's the jazz curator at the Smithsonian Institution. Okay. And several years ago, I attended a lunch talk down the street at the Kennedy School where he spoke on what public administrators could learn from jazz. And this is um, <clears throat> a talk he's given many times. He had 12 lessons, just like a blues in 12 bars. And um, <clears throat> I, I'm sure if anyone is interested, you can go to the internet and, and find some of John's ideas. But uh, they, to a certain extent, dovetail with a lot of what you were talking about. Thank you. That's terrific. I, you know, my web search has not been exhaustive by any means, but um, so many of these studies of different industries and jazz, it's like fill in the blank and jazz, came up in my search. Um, I didn't find anything on journalism, which really surprised me because to me it seems like such a natural fit, but it could just be that jazz feels like a natural fit for a lot of things. We'll see. <laughs> I want to uh, kind of go back to the, the point about community and just mm -hmm. ask you um, in your unique role in thinking about journalism in kind of a new way that leverages social media and, and online resources, um, what's been your experience in interacting with families and how do you think about that as a journalist and balance questions of, of mm -hmm. perhaps objectivity that might drive you to want to keep people that are very impacted by a certain story perhaps at arm's length or at least sort of take an objective eye to them when I would imagine that would be very difficult. Um, yeah. So how do you manage manage that in what you're doing now, and how do you mm -hmm. think broader communities of journalists can, um, can take that into consideration moving forward? Yeah, one of the things that I really love about Homicide Watch that I didn't realize at the beginning is that um, yeah, I, I spoke briefly here about face-to-face -face interaction, and that's primarily how journalists have worked in, in the past. Um, what Homicide Watch allows us to do actually is to step back. Um, and there's sort of this safe mediated zone of the web um, where we can all interact and come in and out as we want. Um, as a crime reporter being sent out to cover stories, you know, I, I would be told, don't come back without a quote from you know, the victim's family or whatever it was. 
Um, with Homicide Watch, I've, I've really stepped back from that in a non-traditional way and said, OK, if we know that the span of this case is going to be two plus years, um, this is going to be a resource and a space for those involved for two plus years. My intention is to make them feel that they can be included from moment one. So if they want to comment to me when I'm standing there with my notebook, that's terrific. If they don't, that's fine too. There are other ways for them to be involved. They can email me. They can call me. They can leave a comment on the website um, using the discuss forum, which they can leave their real name with, or they can not leave their real name with. Um, and people use all of those different methods of communicating with us. Um, I will point out that it's not just victims' families, too. Um, we get a lot of interaction with suspects' families, which I find really, really interesting. Um, I think theirs are often the forgotten voices in crime coverage, and that the families of suspects are struggling to understand, in slightly different but very familiar ways, what is happening to their family as well. Um, one of my favorite comments that we've gotten on the site was from a man who uh, was discussing his son's arrest on a murder case. And he wrote, I believe my son is innocent. He's never lied to me, and this is what he tells me. Um, of course, you go like, <laughs> all right. Um, but in fact, at, at, at trial, he was acquitted. Um, so you have to remember how important all of those voices are, and creating space for them, I think, um, is the most important thing we can do as journalists. Jen McDonald, I'm a Neiman Fellow. Hi, Jen. Hi. Um, as you look at expanding, I'm wondering, are there where, what are the beats you look at and think, we could start using this immediately here? Can you talk a little bit more about that and the variety of those? And also, are there any crucial civic beats where you feel like this kind of reporting really wouldn't work for some reason? Mm. Um, that's a good question. Um, when we, soon after we started Homicide Watch, there were newsrooms in DC that started calling up and saying, you know, we'd really like to talk to you. This is really interesting. And we'd get in there and they'd say, homicides, great. Can we do this for education? <laughs> and um, they say, well, you know, we have this software that, you know, names the victims and suspects. And that's not how we generally like to think about education. <laughs> um, <laughs> although sometimes it may feel as though it's the case. <laughs> um, I, edu education is a beat that I think would be really interesting to put through not the exact framework of Homicide Watch, but the process of thinking that led us there. And when I think about beats and projects to expand to, it's not the structure of Homicide Watch that we look to mimic, um, though so many people do. It's more of the process of identifying what conversations are taking place, how people are looking to have those conversations, what information is needed to support those conversations, what tools the community needs to have those conversations. So even in the journalism context, for us, that means thinking about things like documents libraries and uh, making data available and accessible in interesting ways and adding calendars to our coverage. These are units of journalism um, that aren't typically contained within the traditional print newspaper story and that we have the opportunity to make use of now. And so when we think about expanding the homicide watch process, that's what I think about doing. Whether there's anything that wouldn't work, try me. <laughs> Hi, my name is Steve Provisor. I'm a um, musician and a blogger. And um, I, I commend you for Homicide Watch for a reason that I'll especially uh, consider in the wake of the bombings and uh, the disasters that we've experienced. And which is that, and this is an opinion that's brought a lot of people down on me, which is that we seem to elevate the deaths 
of certain mm -hmm. people in this culture above others. Mm -hmm. Police and firefighters, we respect them tremendously, obviously, but we also pay, literally pay for them as a culture to go en masse, to travel to other cities. We close down highways. We obviously give it much greater attention and reverence and respect. And a site like yours, I think, does something to make us realize that, that this really needs to be rethought. Um, do you get comments about this kind of thing? Do you have any personal response? Uh, not so much anymore. I, I would push back a little bit on that, actually, and say that it depends Gauging the amount of reaction and attention to an individual death, I think, depends on the community you're listening to. That there are patterns of traffic on Homicide Watch DC that are, you know, sort of inexplicable. Um, there will be one, you know, a, a case that is, you know, covered throughout the DC metro area or even nationally that gets, you know, some attention, you know, sort of the usual level of attention on the site. But then, you know, the same weekend there will be another case that is, you know, unnewsworthy for any number of reasons. Um, and the attention on that case will just rise to an incredible level. Um, I think it, pays it, it matters on, uh, about who you're listening to. Um, I think cases like those in particular um, signify that their deaths that are significant in the community, that it, it resonated within a particular neighborhood or school or workplace in a certain way, um, that you know the journalists just didn't know about. I think that that's what's powerful about Homicide Watch, is that because we make that promise of covering everyone, we're able to, one, watch those patterns, um, but then two, also provide that place for people to come. Um, we see immediately, you know, I spoke about reporting from analytics, and um, we've published cases based on tips from analytics, you know, that we've reported out and confirmed, um, but that haven't been um, reported by other media for, you know, maybe another 48 hours or something like that. And it's always surprising to me because we see the bulk of the traffic on that one story for about 48 hours. And it's because the people who are affected by that case aren't looking for some place to go to talk about it or to learn about it next week. They're looking in that instant. Um, and so we try and respond to that. Hi, I'm Saul Tannenbaum. I'm a citizen journalist here in Cambridge. and. I want to shift the metaphor to for a second to call it graphic design and and mm -hmm. ask you about sort of the negative space there of what you're talking about because there are things you haven't said that I find it interesting that you haven't talked about at all. Um, I did cut six thousand words from this. Well, but I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you you haven't said a word about building audience, which I think is interesting and um, you've talked about you know giving a space for a voice but you haven't used you know one of the, the, the buzzwords of the day is amplification you haven't talked about amplification of the voice um, do you see that as, as a role for homicide watch or this sort of journalism or do you just I mean is it in the um, I mean, the motto of your site is sort of both profound and very modest. Um, I mean, it's not about, you know, um, putting people on a soapbox. It's about simply marking and remarking. Which I think makes it, I'm thinking this through right now, but um, <laughs> I will improv. Um, I, I think that that makes it an amplified space, if we think about that that this is some place that people choose to come to and choose to participate in, um, and that those choices amplify the attention to any particular case. Um, we, 
interact with that by doing the comments of the day, as I mentioned, highlighting certain things over others because they have particular narrative that is very strong or a particular message that is very unique. Um, and we do that, I think, not to amplify an individual voice, but to create a stronger framework for future conversation. That the goal is to show people the ways to interact um, and to have these conversations in a way that builds, I think, um, on our future. We want people to come to this site, um, gain a greater understanding of the role of violent crime and homicide in DC, um, shatter some of their assumptions, perhaps, and have a conversation about the way forward, about what this means to their lives and what should happen. Um, so we're amplifying that conversation as well. Yeah. One in the back. Uh, thank you. I'm Claire Dixon, a local jazz musician and writer for Jazz Boston and WBUR. Um, you talked about the relationship between journalists and the general public, um, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on um, the relationship between journalists themselves and different media outlets and uh, how that may need to be changed, mm -hmm. be changed and how that relates to jazz. Yeah, that's actually one of the sections that I cut here, and I think it's really interesting. Um, one thing that really struck me at Marsalis' concert was the interactions between the different musicians, right? I think um, Marsalis was talking about improvising, and you know, he they just played this, and he was asking his piano player, you know, what what happened there? And he said, you know, I was just I was just playing, you know, I was doing this, and you know, I kept trying to give you a sign that you know, like, time to end, you know, like we're good here, and um, and eventually you got it. I think that journalists in at least the smaller newsrooms that I'm most familiar with um, don't work in multidisciplinary teams the way that a musician does with various instruments. Um, the successful projects that I've seen and admire and love um, are built out of multidisciplinary approaches. And I think that that takes an incredible level of communication, um, and even as Marsalis said, sacrificing one person's individual freedom for the greater freedom of the entire band and what is being produced. Um, we see journalists that think that their print story is the only part of the package that matters, right? And when you think about answering those questions about what the audience needs, there's no room for that. Um, I, I think that sacrificing our individual freedoms for more multidisciplinary approaches um, has to change. Yeah. Catherine Florio. Um, I noticed that most of the, or many of the homicides on your site. I'm sorry, I can't quite hear you. I'm sorry. I noticed that many of the homicides on your site are black mm -hmm. and that you and your husband are white. I'm wondering if you get any pushback from the community about bringing negative. Good question. Yeah. Um, we don't, which surprised me at the beginning. And it's part of the reason we built the site the way we did. Um, we just spoke about sacrificing your individual freedom. And one thing that I really made sure of on the site was that it wasn't about me, right? It's, it's not me as the crime reporter that matters here. It's the audience and community that's affected by these crimes. And so we wrote in AP style, which is very straightforward and very direct, just the facts, so that we could create more room for their voices, so that we created that space for them to come forward and talk about their experiences, either through the mediated interaction of an interview with a reporter or the interaction of leaving a comment on the site or doing something like that on their own terms. Um, we did that because of acknowledging that 
were two white kids from California covering homicides in DC. Um, but I think that ultimately it worked in ways that we never imagined, that that space turned out to be what was so special about Homicide Watch, um, and that that's what made us different. Uh, Mindy Koyanis, retired publishing lawyer. Uh, in, in jazz improvisation, we're talking about collaborative artistic expression. In extending that metaphor to journalism, how do you account for issues of veracity and accountability mm. of the collaborators? I, I think you account for it by looking at the strength of your individual collaborators. Um, when you have a multidisciplinary team, I mean, even a non-multidisciplinary team, um, you want to make sure that everyone there is doing their best and that you all are operating under the same culture, the same assumptions, um, and through to the same end. I mean, it, it happens in newsrooms. It happens in startups. Um, I, I don't see it as an issue. Hi, my name is Jessie, and I'm a research assistant at the Berkman Center. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about the very first days of your site and what it was like when you started to cover this and how much, how difficult was it in terms of managing the number of stories mm -hmm. and then a bit about how the site grew and maybe how many people does it take to run it and if you could have resources unlimited, how many people you would actually have to do it. <laughs> Thank you. The resource question. Um, it started very quietly. Um, we had no money, so we didn't do any marketing or outreach or press or anything like that. Um, we had 500 page views in our first month, which was um, October of 2010, and I was really excited because I came from the newsroom and had never been aware of 500 people reading me before. Um, and then our next month, Chris, help me with the next number. It was like 507,000 because we, again, no marketing, no uh, didn't really tell anybody. Um, they'll just found it. And then uh, in December, we had... Um, Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I'll use the microphone. So, yeah, the first month we had 500 page views. The second month we had 7,000. December we had 35,000, and that just freaked us out. Um, and at that point, the Washington Post called us and did a profile on the site um, because I think they said, somebody must have written about this by now, but let's do a profile. And, um, and then we hit about 80,000 page views in January, and it stuck there. And we, we figured that traffic would spike, but um, what we found is that there was, there was clearly an audience that was looking for this, and so when they, when they found it, they just stayed with us for a long time. And then after relaunch, um, we hit about 300,000 page views a month. And... Um, Dipped down when I took the fellowship here. Um, we ran a Kickstarter campaign, raised forty-seven thousand dollars to pay student reporters and editors and interns to run the site while we're here. So they're not working for free at the moment. They are not working for free. We pay them. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. Um, <laughs> and so we they they add we have three. They add up to about one and a quarter FTEs. Um, and they are awesome. And they are awesome. They, they're really incredible. Um, we only cover cases, um, or let me put it this way, we don't cover cases that predate our launch. So, you know, it's been this accumulation of cases over time. So, you know, the first few months were, in fact, you know, not crazy busy, um, which is good because we were still figuring out what it was we were trying to do. Um, I remember my first day at DC Superior Court, I walked into a courtroom for a hearing, you know, thinking like, what are they going to think about me, right? And um, I struck up a conversation with an attorney, uh, a prosecutor, and said, you know, I have this idea, this is what I'm trying to do. And he said, you know, thank you for being here. Um, there's a Pulitzer to be run won in these hallways every day. And at the time, I was like, yeah, right. Um, but after six months in the courthouse, it, you can't walk into a courtroom and not find a story. Um, it, it's an incredible wealth, not of stories, you know, that are, you know, 
crazy crime stories, but of stories that are about everyday people living their lives and interacting with the criminal justice system in ways that we as a community should know about. Um, and that's been really interesting to learn. We can just take two more. Hi, my name is Beverly Meyer. I'm a citizen journalist with Neighbor Media, but I also for many years have taught young people, uh, journalists, uh, young journalists and, uh, vid and video and audio creators. Um, you mentioned your staff. So how many people work for you? How many are people of color? And if there are people of color, how do they react? How, what's the reaction? What's the difference in reaction? Sure. Um, we have three interns um, right now, two of color. Um, I'll give a shout out to Penny Ray. Hi, Penny, if he's watching. He's our um, editor right now. He uh, was a reporter for us uh, from the very beginning in October when the Kickstarter money came through and did a, such a terrific job. We moved him up um, to be an editor. He's a black man with this terrific long hair that he straightens, actually, and realizes that he looks very unique at the courthouse. Um, he wears this leather jacket, and he just has incredible style, and uh, regardless of his race, actually. And um, often says to me that people recognize him at the courthouse all the time, um, which is terrific for a young reporter to start to feel that they're a part of that community. But I mean, frankly, it, it, he understands that it helps him out on stories, that he's able to build those connections, and people know who he is. Um, yeah. How does he react to this? Uh, do you see a difference in the reaction from your reporters who are of color as opposed to the whites who are not? Yeah, not approach. in any way that I've really thought about, but I'm going to think about it now. Yeah. 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 If we can do one more before my voice dies. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for such great questions. I mentioned that I've just started this project and I'm still so very much in the beginning stages and this is really helping. Hi, my name is Leonid, I'm a Burke turn. Um, one of the questions I had was, in more violent places than the United States where homicide rates are like in the thousands, um, is there, like, how, how would you, I guess scale is the right wrong word, but how would you think about, address, I mean, doing this kind of project there, like where there's like 14 deaths in a random suicide bombing? Yeah, um, one of our projects actually, um, so our business model is to license the software behind Homicide Watch to run Homicide Watch for other cities, and then also to consult and build other projects for newsrooms as well. Um, but our first expansion site was actually Trenton, New Jersey, um, which has you know, a somewhat depressing number of homicides simply because any number of homicides is depressing. And there was a real question at that point of, is there a level of homicide that can support this? That's not a question that we ask in our business, actually. Um, because for us, it's not about the number. Um, for every case there, are many, many more people affected. There's the family of the victim, the friends, the colleagues and coworkers, um, the emergency room doctors and nurses who treat them, and the same for the suspects as well. And so when we look at the audience for any particular case, it's just these circles that ripple out further and further. Um, and there, there is a community that is interested in accurate information, engaging information, and tools to respond to that for any particular case, regardless of whether there are five or 500 homicides in a community. I really do believe that. Thank you so much, you guys. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Laura, for bringing us your message of community and caring. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.